My name is Earl Franks. I'm with the New Mexico Department of Transportation, and I'll be the moderator for this first session. Welcome to New Mexico. We're happy to have you all. I uh, mentioned this in the new member orientation uh, lunch that uh, I've always gotten a lot more out of this partnership than I've put in. And so this is our opportunity to uh, uh, put in a little bit of effort and, and host this year, and we're happy to. Uh, I was trying to look up some funny facts about New Mexico, and I, I think you guys could probably do a pretty good job of that yourselves. So just one that stuck out in my mind was that there's still a state law on the books that you cannot wear a sombrero while you're dancing. So. <laughs> I hope that none of you go out dancing tonight and wear your hat and we have to go bail you out because that's probably what they'll throw you in jail for here. So I want to introduce our first presenter. His name's uh, Shane Coleman. He's our state bridge engineer. I met Shane uh, in 2017, I believe. He was working for T.Y. Lynn at the time and uh, we had a bridge hit on I-10 at uh, about mile marker 93 and we had a bridge preservation project going on at the time, uh, two, like, uh, uh, two sets of twin bridges. There were uh, continuous, uh, conventionally reinforced concrete slab deck bridges. And uh, we had a contractor that had traffic crossed over from the uh, westbound lanes to where all the traffic was on the eastbound lanes because we were replacing approach slabs. And uh, a commercial vehicle got hung up on the guardrail and uh, slammed into a grade separation between the two sets of twin bridges. And uh, it, it was a two column concrete uh, pier system. And, and we ha we've actually had one of those come completely down getting hit before, way before my time. Uh, and it pretty severely damaged the column. So our guys that are, uh, the District 1 bridge section structure crew is over in that corner. They were up uh, the entire night because we had interstate traffic stopped and they were implementing a, a shoring plan there so that we could get uh, traffic back underneath the bridge. Uh, and the following day, I believe, our state bridge engineer brought Shane out uh, they, we had them on an on-call contract and uh, were able to use them to to put a design together in pretty short order to fix it. And we actually did a change order on that project and had the bridge contractor that was doing the preservation work uh, tackle that job. And we also took the opportunity to do some more bridge main, uh, preservation on, on that bridge. So uh, Shane is a New Mexico State Aggie. He's a, a great engineer. He, uh, <clears throat> he uh, has done some great things in his time as state bridge engineer. He's uh, restructured his group to uh, take better care of our, our precast product inspection. And uh, he's also networked really well with our design consultants and, and I think got all, the, all of them on the same page. So I'll turn it over to Shane. Thanks, Earl. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Albuquerque. On behalf of the New Mexico Department of Transportation, I'd like to welcome you all to New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Uh, New Mexico is honored to host this year's Western Bridge Preservation Partnership meeting. And unfortunately, the Transportation Secretary Cerna and Deputy Secretary Doolittle were una unable to attend today to give opening remarks. So I'm stepping in to fill their shoes. Um, it is being after, since it is after lunch and we're known for our carb heavy food, hopefully uh, I don't put you all to sleep this afternoon. So I'll stay out of the uh, real technical bridge specification uh, talk today. So I was scheduled just to talk about bridge preservation. So now it's, uh, it's grown. So again, I'm Shane Coleman. I'm the NMDOT state bridge engineer and I'm responsible for our bridge infrastructure for the state. All right, so for those of you that may not be familiar with New Mexico, I thought I'd uh, go over some highlights and facts about our state. Um, New Mexico became a state in uh, 1912. We're the 47th state uh, to join the Union. 
Our population is just over 2 million people, and uh, we're the fifth largest state by land area. About 35% of our uh, land is federally owned. Our highest peak is just over 13,000 feet, and our uh, low elevation is just under 3,000. We are a pretty dry state, so we only get about 14 inches of rain a year. Um, we actually have had a, a wet summer and winter this year, so a little more than normal. Uh, we have a couple of national parks. Some of you may have been to Carlsbad Caverns and White Sands. Uh, we have 14 national monuments, and uh, Albuquerque is known for the International Balloon Fiesta, so if you have had the opportunity to see it, or if you haven't had the opportunity, I highly recommend you make it to New Mexico in October to uh, see the Balloon Fiesta. It's, it's, very, it's a spectacular event. Uh, Santa Fe is known for the Native American market and a lot of history there, uh, being one of the oldest capitals in the United States. And then um, as far as economy, we are pretty reliant on the federal government, and then we have a big oil and gas uh, industry here. Also, I listed a few more of the types of industry we have. We have national labs, some Air Force bases. Um, tourism is a big thing here um, with the, the Pueblos and everything. And, and then uh, recently, it's not on here, but the movie industry has kind of moved in and has become a, a big uh, economic source for us lately. Um, if you've seen Breaking Bad and other shows like that. So it's, uh, it's booming. I know I have a lot of friends that actually work in the movie industry doing sets and stuff. So, so since I was asked to do the opening remarks for the department, I went on our website to get our mission statement and, and kind of what the DOT is about. And I have it listed here, but um, I'm always reminded when I see this of what the uh, secretary said when I first joined the DOT about 12 years ago. And uh, at the time, the secretary was Mrs. Rhonda Fott, and she talked about how important our jobs were with the department as far as the impact to not only our state, but also to the country. We have two, uh, three major interstates that cross our, our state. And she, she used an example of Walmart where if you shut down I-40 at each side of the state due to a snowstorm or a bridge is out, then in a few days you'd start to see bare shelves at the stores like Walmart. And I think the pandemic kind of was a reminder of that, that when you, uh, when you have a high demand of, of items that you can quickly see those things disappear. So she just talked about how important uh, our jobs were uh, to the public and not only our local public, but also the country as a whole. Um, I also included a picture of our state bird, the Roadrunner. Um, they're pretty cool creatures. I didn't realize how feisty they were, and I saw a video of one actually fighting with a rattlesnake, and, and it won, so don't want to mess with them. Uh, here's a map of our, our state. So the NMDOT is broken down into six districts, as shown on the screen. <clears throat> they're not equal in, in area, but... Um, Pretty distributed for bridge wise they're all pretty equal um, we have a heavy concentration in district 3 with our uh, since it's our major metropolitan area um, and then our general office where the engineers and the infrastructure support are at uh, and the bridge bureau is in Santa Fe New Mexico so with that um, since I was asked to do the opening remarks for a bridge preservation conference um, I had the opportunity to do a presentation on the history of New Mexico's bridges last year at WASHTO. So I thought for an intro, since we're talking about preservation, it'd be good to know the, the history of what we're trying to preserve and what we're dealing with. Um, so this graphic kind of shows uh, a breakdown by decade of when our bridges were built in our current inventory. So it starts in the early 1900s and goes through to current time, and as you can see in the early 1900s, there wasn't a lot of bridges constructed, but then it started to increase in the 30s and 40s, and then we had a big boom in the 50s and 60s, and our average age of bridge in New Mexico is just over 50 years. I think it's around 54, actually. So as I go through the history of bridges, this uh, graphic will it'll tie into that history and make more sense. So New Mexico is a dry, a dry arid desert state. I mean. We, we don't have a lot of water, but we do have some major rivers. The Rio Grande is probably the biggest and most well-known. And before there was dams and levees to control flooding, um, it swelled a lot and, and grew in size during the monsoon season. And we still have big, heavy monsoons in the summer 
ju late June through August. <clears throat> But with the engineered systems in place, they don't swell to this size anymore. But as I was going through the history, there was times that the Rio Grande was over a mile wide in Albuquerque. And to try and cross that in a high flow event was, I mean, it was dangerous and potentially deadly. So it definitely had a big impact on uh, people trying to cross it. So here's an example of some attempts to try and bridge across the Rio Grande. Um, this is a, a photo from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this bridge collapsed in 1912, but as you can see, it was a truss uh, system. And as I went through and put together my presentation on the history, there was a lot of these trusses that were brought into New Mexico that were fabricated in Kansas and other states, but they didn't engineer the bridge for the crossing. They weren't collecting uh, hydraulic data. So a lot of these bridges that were put up uh, were quickly washed away during flood of the flood season and the heavy monsoon flows. But in the last 100 years, um, like the rest of the country, New Mexico has been able to meet these challenges and develop a reliable transportation network of roads and bridges uh, with engineering, better materials, and a better understanding of river hydraulics. Um, I included this photo. This is the Logan Segmental Bridge when it was being constructed. It's since opened and uh, was one of our larger bridges uh, constructed in recent history. And this is out in Logan, New Mexico, which is pretty much in the middle of nowhere. But it carries uh, US 54 traffic, which is one of the main, arc main routes for the trucking industry from Chicago to El Paso. So, um, you can kind of break the bridge history for the state down into these time periods, uh, starting at the prehistoric and colonial era, era, which was the late 1500s through the mid 1800s. And then when we transitioned to more of a territory, that was the mid 1800s through early 1900s, and then early statehood. And there was a big shift there uh, for the state when we, be, when we became a state, as far as infrastructure. And then the 30s and 40s uh, with the work programs during the Depression and then war shortages due to World War II. And then if you think back to that graph, that's where you start seeing the bridges increase in the 30s and 40s. And then in the 50s when you had that spike was when the interstate system uh, started to be constructed. And then the last era is from the 60s till now. So like most Western states, our primary bridge types are timber bridges, steel bridges, reinforced concrete, and then pre-stressed bridges. And we do have some timber bridges in service that are over 100 years old, and uh, they're still in our inventory. So starting at the prehistoric and colonial periods, um, this was when the Pueblo inhabitants were here and the uh, Anasazi. They did have some road networks, mo mainly trails that connected the Pueblos. Uh, and then after that, it kind of transitioned to when you had the Spanish and Mexican colonial uh, rule here, and they started to build more road systems uh, that concentrated on trade routes. Uh, two of our more well-known trade routes are the Camino Royal Trail and then the Santa Fe Trail. And these were fragmented systems that um, they weren't all clearly connected, and, and there were some attempts to build bridges, but nothing that really stood up and and was able to cross the major rivers like the Rio Grande and the Rio Puerco, and those are those rivers listed there in red. Uh, and then towards the early to mid 1800s, that's when uh, Spanish uh, and Mexican uh, rule was present in New Mexico, and they tried to uh, increase the trade route, and there was a lot of trade going through, but they really didn't make any progress as far as bridge construction. Or in, the most reliable method to cross rivers was at the uh, was to ford it, which, again, when you're dealing with flooding and monsoon events, is problematic. So here's some examples of the types of bridges that were built during this time frame. As you can see, they're just simple timber structures. Um, the one in the right shows some timber uh, piers that were constructed uh, at the Rio Grande, with just a simple timber superstructure. And then the, the bottom middle photo is the Santa Fe Trail at Apache Canyon. The date I have here is um, 1835. Um, a historian that was at Washtenaw actually told me that he thinks that date might be off, but this is from UNM, so I'll just leave it at that. After the, when we move into the territorial period, 
this was basically from like before the Civil War to just before New Mexico became a state. Roads and bridges were primarily handled by local governments or counties. Um, again, there was no engineering. There wasn't a, a source for funding to build and, and make better bridges and roads. And the routes were really disconnected. Um, with the Civil War, there was an increased military presence in New Mexico. Uh, there were several forts that were established. There was the famous Battle at Glorieta Pass. So uh, again, there was some road construction uh, just for the, for the war effort, but there was not any funding from the federal government. It was a hands-off approach as far as roads and bridges. And again, the types of bridges were primarily timber with closely spaced supports and shallow superstructures. So the ones that were uh, constructed, typically overtopped, uh, had to rebuild up and washed away. So there's not a lot of history or those bridges left now. And then <clears throat> as we move to the later end of the territorial period, there was starting to be an uptick of public pressure for better roads and and a commission was established. And then there was some counties that were gathering taxes and collecting money to try and make a, a better infrastructure network. So one of the big things that spurred the development and progress of roads and bridges, primarily in New Mexico, was around 1880 or 1879. That's when the railroad uh, moved into New Mexico. And with railroad came engineering. They were building stronger bridges. They were building them taller, getting them out of the floodplains and they were building uh, bridges on more robust foundations. Uh, they started using new materials uh, instead of just timber. They were using masonry and iron, steel, and then the timber they were using for foundations were multi-tiered uh, foundation structures. And then you started to see more scientific planning or engineering and design uh, being put into the bridges, and then uh, hydraulics were being studied. So. They started putting extreme gauges to get flow data for design and construction. And also the railroad introduced concrete culverts. So here's some examples of the types of railroad bridges that you started seeing. Um, you definitely like the upper left photo, you see uh, taller masonry piers and uh, longer spans and, and then steel and iron being used to get longer spans. And then in the, the bottom middle, you, you have the timber multi-tiered uh, trestles um, that they started using that were engineered. So as we transition just before statehood or early statehood, um, that was also when there was kind of a national push to start developing uh, better roads. Uh, New Mexico at this time, actually, the roads were being uh, built for tourism. People wanted to come and see New Mexico and all the different sites that New Mexico had to offer. So they started building roads for tourism. Um, and then there was that transformational shift into new bridge construction. And again, increased public pressure for better roads to, to get those networks that tourists could come and, and visit the state. Here's a couple of examples of bridges that were built at this time. Uh, these are timber structures uh, that were engineered. As you can see, they're more consistent spans and better foundations. Um, some of these bridges were up in service up until recent years. I think we replaced that one in the bottom right not too long ago. That was one of Earl's bridges. So, uh, like I said, New Mexico became a state in 1912. So, some, like I said, big things started to happen then. Uh, shortly after statehood in 1913, the New Mexico State Highway Commission was established and there was a state engineer position created and that position uh, had increased oversight over road and bridge construction. Um, an engineer from a Georgetown graduate was brought out to New Mexico and he was the first state engineer uh, in New Mexico. And everything that was constructed went through his office and, and was reviewed and approved prior to construction. About that time in 1914, the American Association of State Highway Officials was formed, um, which is now Ashto. And then in 1916 and 1921, the federal government had acts that strengthened the state's role and provided a connected federal highway system. And then they also initiated federal funding with a state match for road construction. And then in 1919, New Mexico enacted its first gasoline tax, which was used for roads. And it's one of our main sources still for road construction. Um, but like I said, roads and bridges were brought under that cent centralized control by the state uh, engineer. The state engineer um, focused on scientific methods and engineering, 
And again, using the hydraulic data to design, they also came up with a lot of standardized designs so that the local in-house forces could build bridges. We have a lot of bridges in our inventory that were built off of timber standards and uh, reinforced concrete standards uh, that are still in service and are part of our focus of preservation and replacement right now. Just like the railroad, we advanced our foundation design and uh, pile driving was introduced and that was uh, helped out by surplus war equipment and, that was provided to the states. Uh, treated timber started to become available and used in bridge construction. And with our climates, uh, timber, the treated timber has held up very well over time, um, yeah, both on the railroad and on our highway bridges. <laughs> and then also for the longer crossings, the steel trusses that were brought in before were still being used, but now engineering was being applied to it to uh, keep them uh, in place and designed for the crossing so that they didn't wash out. And just concrete became uh, used more and more for abutments and then also culverts and then slab bridges, which in our climate, uh, slab bridges perform very well. We have some really old slab bridges in service that have held up well. So here's some examples of the steel trusses that were built at this time frame that are still in service uh, or they're still up and are being used as, or just for their historic nature have been left in place. But you see we have some uh, pony trusses, some deck through trusses, so some cool structures here that were built in the early or 1915 to 1930 era. Here's some examples of, from, of the first reinforced concrete bridges that were built in New Mexico. The one in the left, uh, let's see, was built on at Santa Clara, New Mexico. And the date on this is 1922. And then another cool structure that we have in the state is the uh, Ottawa suspension uh, bridge. It's a timber structure over the Rio Grande, and this is near Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, and it's a nice pedestrian crossing that you can go to. Uh, so in the 1930s and 40s, during the Depression and the Public Works Acts, uh, Route 66 was rerouted in New Mexico between 26 and 37. And this helped cut down about 107 miles to get across the state, made a more direct route. Um, shown in this, on this slide are some of the bridges that were built in that you can still go to today. Uh, I'll note the one in the middle, the truss there, it's just east of Albuquerque uh, at I-40. If you're looking for a good green chili cheeseburger, the, uh, the gas station there has the famous uh, Laguna Burger. I, I highly recommend it. And then the one in the upper right is uh, over Central Avenue here, or Central in, in Albuquerque, and that bridge is still there. So it's just right up the street. Okay, so going back to our graphic, that big spike was when the interstate system began. So in 1956, federal legislation created the interstate system and then established the Highway Trust Fund. In 1956, the New Mexico State Highway Department initiated five contracts uh, for the building of the interstate system. And New Mexico was prepared to begin construction immediately. And at the beginning of the interstate building, they actually led the nation in interstate uh, spending. And by 1958, New Mexico had completed 245 miles of interstate in New Mexico, and it was about a quarter of the total of interstate constructed in New Mexico. Also at this time, for the bridge nerds in the room, including myself, there was a, a new technology that was developed, and this was pre-stressed concrete. Uh, in 1951, the Walnut Lane Bridge was constructed in Philadelphia, and it was the first pre-stressed concrete structure. And New Mexico built its first pre-stressed concrete bridge in 1956. Uh, that bridge is shown in the photo, and that's the Alameda Bridge over the Rio Grande, which is still in place today. It's been closed to traffic, but bicyclists and pedestrians use it to cross uh, the Rio Grande. And if you have time and want to go take a look at it, um, I recommend it, it's a, it's a nice structure. And then here's some renderings or some details from those plan sets that my bridge load, load rating engineer provided. So now moving into the 1960s, um, the interstate building continued and by 19, uh, there was about a thousand miles of interstate built in New Mexico. By 1962, 40% of the interstate system had been constructed in New Mexico. And by 1971, it was 76% complete. And then the last segment was completed around 1987 
and that was the Las Vegas bypass. So that's I-25 around Las Vegas. So um, New Mexico did a good job uh, building interstate and spending those funds. Here's some examples of bridges that were constructed uh, with the interstate building. In the left is I-40 twin bridges uh, over the Rio Grande. Um, those are uh, up the road. They've been widened over time, but uh, those are the, uh, the first bridges that were constructed there. In the middle photo is I-25 over Alamosa Canyon. Uh, those bridges were actually replaced a few years ago. And in the upper right is I-25 over Nogal Canyon, and that bridge is still in service. It's currently being studied, and uh, design plans are being put together for its replacement here in the coming years. But overall, the steel's in pretty good condition. There's some corrosion and pack rust present, but our climate, again, is favorable to steel and timber. So in the 1960s, with the interstate building, you started to see more traffic, faster speeds, and heavier commercial traffic. So safety started becoming an issue. You started to see more fatalities on the interstate. So there were studies done to see how safety could be improved, especially at bridge crossings on the interstate. Um, so they found that having the piers close to the roadway was uh, unfavorable because there was a lot of impacts and fatalities there. So you started to, well, there was a push to start opening up the spans. So you started seeing more clear span bridges and two span bridges at interstate crossings. So you started seeing the bridges that were constructed in the upper photo where you had the piers close to the roadway and in the median, and there was a shift to what you see in the lower photos where you have bigger clear spans and those uh, abutments and piers moved away from the roadway uh, to increase safety. And I didn't wanna just uh, show steel, so here's some examples of pre-stressed concrete bridges that we have in our inventory. Um, showing that same type of long span, long clear span. So the top one is I-25 over a New Mexico 14. And then the bottom photo is University Boulevard over, over I-25 at Las Cruces. And um, the I wanted to show this lower photo just because the intricate artwork that went into all the panels on this bridge. It's, uh, there's another bridge that crosses over one of the local roads and it has, a, again, a lot of uh, nice artwork that was implemented in it. I think the artwork costs more than the bridge. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.